All right. Hello, everyone. Hello, hello. Thank you all for being here. Um, this week's discussion is uh, on the foundations of Japanese Sotoshu, as, uh, or Soto Zen Buddhism. And I'm going to be going into some detail about the lineage of Sotoshu, and then describe a bit about its founder in Japan, Dogen. Because he, this figure, Dogen, really comes um, strong, it, it comes into the scene strong with a determined and particular way to uh, practice Zen meditation. And through that, I hope that it helps to kind of distinguish a Soto style of Zen, uh, differing from, from that of Rinzai Zen that we discussed last month. Because as similar as these two schools are, both being meditation practice schools, they do differ in approach to and type of meditation practice. But more on that in a bit. So, <clears throat> like Eisai before him, Dogen had brought to Japan a particular form of Chinese Chan Buddhism. Uh, that form, the Cao uh, Dong Zong, sorry, my Chinese is not done, I'm going to try. Um, or the Cao Dong school is what Soto would be become in Japan. So uh, Cao Dong and Soto are the same, same characters. Uh, and this lineage, uh, Cao Dong, was founded in the 9th, 9th century. Uh, and took rise over time in the Song Dynasty, which was uh, 960 to 1279. Um, and again, Chan during this time, meditation practice style of schools were all the rage. And so this is just one of those lineages. Not as popular as Rinzai's predecessor, the Linji lineage, we again talked about last month, but still, Cao Dong was an up-and-comer, you know? It relied upon the idea of the Tathagatagarbha theory, that there's an innate seed of awakening within all beings. And it is this Buddha nature that's always there that we need to experience. And to do that, we need to let go of our desiring, our dukkha, our striving, all those things, and that's all done through silent, seated meditation. Zolchan or Zazen, seated meditation. The foundational premise of Sandong practice can be represented uh, by the phrase Mo Zao, which can be translated as silent reflection, uh, silent illumination or serene reflection. But really, to, to let's look at the two characters here, uh, because obviously these are admittedly horrible translations. Um, mo, mo uh, the, the calligraphy here is of, uh, of the mo zan, mo zao. Mo, mo is, um, means silent, but it also means uh, dark or, or black, uh, profound. Secret. Uh, I, I think of hushed. And Zhao is to brighten, to light up, to shine like the sun, to reflect that brightness, to see clearly, to see into. So together, Mo Zhao can be can illuminate the secret. We reflect the profundity. We see through the hushed black of uncertainty, of letting go, to see beyond fears and anger, to silently illuminate in sitting meditation, through the doing and focusing on what is and this premise of silent meditation over time took nuanced meanings. And by the time Dogen arrives in China around 1223, the master he eventually trains with to be initiated into the Zhao Tong lineage, he himself had adapted the phrase 
I'm gonna, I'm gonna butcher this, Jirguan Dazhou. Uh, and, and thus, so did Dogen, uh, having learned it as Shikantasa in Japanese. Jirguan, Shikan, Jirguan, it, I should say, Shikan is not Shikan the way we think of Shikan. It's not our Shi and Kan, our uh, Shimanta and Vipassana. The, you can see uh, the two first characters are, are different. And here, uh, uh, so Shikan, they sound the same, but Jirguan means only, or, or me merely, just, just this, just doing, with all means, only concerned with that. Dazo is meditation. S sitting um, cross-legged, particularly. So together, just sitting. Shikantaza. But we're doing only sitting. We're focused on that doing of sitting. Now, this was at odds with much of, uh, of what was predominant in the other Chan schools in China at the time, in that there was no focus of the meditation. It's just, just sitting, being aware, doing the current moment. The other schools of Chinese Chan had a predilection for koan use or other mechanisms. Not that Dong or later Soto ruled koan out completely. As Munchin Sensei said last, uh, last month that uh, Soto Shu did use koan, although that kind of diminished in the 18th century or so when it really phased out, but that's a whole other story. Um, but really, time on the cushion was not spent wrestling with illogical phrases. It was a time for awareness, pure awareness. And for Dogen, this is exactly what he was looking for. A pure, true method to awakening. And to put that desire for Dogen into context, more about him. Okay. Uh, he's born in 1200, which would have been about 15 years after the formal uh, establishment of the shogunate power. And by 12,000, Honen is already causing a ruckus in Kyoto with his Pure Land teachings, Jodo Shu teachings. Um, Eisai is already returned from China, having established some form of Zen in Kyoto already. Um, and so this is the kind of environment he's growing up in. And all the biographies tout this, these amazing stories about his childhood, but particularly that he has great academic prowess, as many of the founders do. Uh, he could read the Chinese classics. He read Vasubandhu's uh, commentary on the, um, uh, the uh, Abhidharma, the trans Chinese translation of the Abhidharma, the Pali Canon commentary, uh, all by the age of eight. Um, <laughs> I mean, you know. Uh, no, but really, the biographies just point out particularly um, the death of his parents as really formative. He lost his father by two or three, his mother by seven. And, and according to the biographies, this really marked, this gave him his first glimpse at what impermanence is. And that really was what spurred him to strive to be a Buddhist monk and blah, 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 blah. The story ensues, right? But inevitably, he, he's living with his uncle um, after his parents died. And at 12, he runs away. He goes to another family member who is uh, uh, in the clergy, and he climbs Mount, Mount Tia, and by 13, he's an ordained novice monk. Right. Now, again, like a broken record, uh, he's a little dissatisfied with Ten the state of Tendaishu, as all these other founders of these new schools of Buddhism during the Kamakura period, he too was dissatisfied. Uh, but I have to say here that I might make a distinction in so much as they're not necessarily dissatisfied with the Tendai teachings, per se, but more the establishment of what Tendai and, in fact, Japanese Buddhism on the whole had become. This is this post-Han era. It's the, the third gate, one of the three gates of power in Japan, the emperor, the shogunate, the, and, and the establishment of Buddhism, the institution of Buddhism. 
So a lot of these founders are bucking that change, not necessarily Tendai teachings on the whole, although they'll get in a little bit, but we'll, we'll get to that. Um, so it sounds really repetitive, but yeah, he's a little, he wanted to study and train. Like from a young kid, he has this idea, oh, I, you know, I'm gonna, when I grow up, I'm gonna be a Buddhist priest. I, I don't know, maybe that's how he sounded like. But you can imagine, oh, I get to go to Hiezan. And he gets there and all he sees is corruption, uh, warring factions, you know, uh, um, uh, not the greatest behaviors one would see at a, at a religious institution for training, right? Um, and so he's a little disillusioned and he descends the, the mountain by the age of 17. He goes and sees a senpai of his, uh, a teacher of his. Um, Cohen and Cohen suggests to him to, like Asai, go to China. Asai found this amazing new form of um, Chan. You might find what you're looking for there. So, in that in that vein of being interested in this in this uh, advent of a trip to China, he goes to Kenenji. Kenenji is a, a, a temple that Asai founded and actually built, um, and it becomes the Zen practice center for training during this time. And Myo Zen, who was Asai's chief disciple, is the abbot of Kenenji at this point. And Dogen with Myo Zen, they train together for the next four or five years. Um, <laughs> until they uh, both together go to China in 1223. And there, Dogen really finds his chance. This is, okay, Hiezan didn't have it, Maybe China will, right? He gets there and he gets to study all the major predominant schools of Chan Buddhism going on at that time. Now, they're the predominant schools. So guess what? They were riled with social corruption, uh, power struggles, things like that, because that's what helped them become predominant in the first place, right? So he sees these schools being, being detracted and or affected by the world around them. And, and so somehow is, is yet still unfulfilled, not having found a true way, something good enough, pure enough. And he really wanted that awakening, so lo and behold, luckily he finds his guy, right? He finds a Saozong priest, he trains with him for the next three years, and uh, is, becomes registered in the lineage, becomes a lineage holder, teacher allowed to teach back in Japan and it is with this that he returns in, in 1227. He's 27 years old. Okay. Immediately Dogen goes to Kenenji, back to Kenenji, and he starts expounding on the way that he understood understood his version of Zen as being Shakyamuni Buddha's true teaching. Shikantaza. Just sitting. That was it. All the major teachers, including Shakyamuni Buddha, like Esai had argued, all those major teachers and patriarchs had experienced awakening through seated meditation. If it was good enough for them. <laughs> I mean, yes, there were of course other ways of um, ways to awakening. Dogen never eschewed those per se, but he did see Shikantaza as the true pure way to get there that the way to awakening was not through ritual, as he put it. He had this idea that by lighting, can by lighting incense and burning candles, you're not attaining awakening by doing those things. That's, it's only through Zazen. And we even see that although Dogen was carrying the Zaodong lineage, the influences he imposed upon Sotoshu reflected a desire to return to the earlier forms of Chinese Chan styles from the Tang Dynasty, the, what he would see as the truer versions of early Chan. And to emphasize these points, he wrote meticulous instruction manuals and regulations for Zen monastic life based on those early um, Chan writings. He incorporated teachings like the Five Ranks poem uh, to help explain the process of Zen practice. The pro poem is written in your handout, it, and, and I provided it that way only because it's a little long to include in a slideshow. 
uh, and even longer to actually cover and explain um, its profundity. So, uh, only because it, it's a koan in and of itself a bit, and, and it, it explains the stages that a practitioner experiences through Zen practice. And, and I have to say, I, I admittedly went on a deep dive on the, on the five ranks. Uh, it's used in the, the most Zen, Zen schools, Chan schools. Um, and so, really influential, but uh, that's a whole other discussion. Um, only because I don't want to bore you with that right now. I'll save that for another time. All right. Um, and, and I'm only just getting into the book itself, but the, I, I like the reference. I like the, the book. It's referenced at the bottom of the handout if you're interested. Right, okay. Dogen, sorry. Um, so he uses a lot of these early types of Chan writings as the basis for many of his essays that are collected in his now very famous work, the Shobo Genzo. Um, for its part, Tendai did at least have leave one mark on Dogen, um, and that is he always considered the Lotus Sutra as the predominant sutra. Again, he considers it the truest and purest dharma transmitted. So then, everything else is superfluous. All the other sutras, all the other practices, they are useful, but are skillful means. And when he returned from China, he even argued against secular Zen, or describing or practicing Zen in any other way than Shikantaza. These are, because all these breathing techniques or visualizations or all these different methods, uh, for him seemed like decorations to something that was already pure. He admonished um, esoteric meditations and nembutsu meditations or other kind of more active contemplative meditations, which all flew in the face of Rinzai Zen because uh, uh, Esai himself um, drove to bridge many of the schools, having tried to bring Rinzai Zen as a way to bolster Tendai Shu, he was creating Zen halls in Tendai and Shingon and other schools' temples, while inviting Tendai and Shingon and other schools' priests to Zen halls to train. But Dogen saw all of that as sullying his Zen. Even more, considering Zen's Tatagata Garba's stance that all beings, regardless of time and space, have innate Buddha-ness, you can imagine his opinions about Mapo, the age of the degenerate Dharma. It would be nonsensical. And so you can imagine his ideas and opinions about Jodoshu and Jodo Shinshu, considering the foundations of those schools are predicated on the idea of Mapo. So, you can imagine he did not go over very well. <laughs> he was not received by all parties. Um, and so, slowly, they kind of just push him out of Kyoto. Um, and, and, and so, and so uh, by 1243, he's leaving Kyoto and goes to an, a more northern prefecture, um, uh, uh, Echizen, Echizen pre Prefecture, which is kind of between um, Kyoto and, and Kamakura, directly north on the northern edge of the main island, um, if you care. Um, but this is where he founds Eheji. Dogen, and Eheji becomes Dogen's ideal for Sotoshu, because it's a place for a few devoted, earnest followers in a secluded environment, living in um, seamless effort with each other. Every action and activity done with presence and purposefulness and intent. Every role in the monastery helping for the life of the monastery. And Eheji became that place, a place of harmony harmony with nature and harmony with each other, and for Dogen, a place for earnest practice. And in his later years, in this type of environment, living with other monks this way, Dogen comes to see the importance of every aspect of life as Zen practice. 
For as much as he argues for just zazen, just sitting, he comes to describe later that all actions in life can be training, and thus ways to awakening. He wrote the manual instructions for the chief cook, which is an outline for the cook of the monastery and how to be. And if you don't know what that might look like, then you haven't seen how Shimon Sensei cooks, and you haven't tasted her food. And so this focus on everyday actions would imply that even lay life, men and women, anyone can attain Buddhahood. But for Dogen, the hindrance really came down to one's determination and the distractions of life. He did not like trying to find compromises. If you can't tell, he's fairly uncompromising. Either you're dedicated or you're not. You're either doing shikantaza or you're, you don't. And if, but if you do, are you in a secluded place? Are you following the precepts? Practicing diligently? The, the type of Zen Dogen touted is a more gradual unfolding of one's awakening. So in one's life, all aspects should replicate that mojao, that silent reflection. And an, immer an immersion of one's whole being into that state. I, I think of flow or being in the zone, but imagine that all the time as you, as you wash, as you eat, as you walk, uh, walk, in order to go and sit, to do shikantaza, and you're already in that meditative state and are able to dive deeper into the depths of unknowing. Now, I caution, as I did last month, um, around uh, using Zen cliches, stereotypes, tropes. Um, I you just used one myself, and uh, uh, saying, uh, referring it to uh, being in the zone, right? Meanwhile, we like to get Zen out. <laughs> no, look, don't get trapped in those tropes. We, we have a lens of how we view Zen practice. We have preconceived notions of what a Zen state is. And I might, and I will say the caveat that I'm sure there are Zen practitioners here online. They have the experience of Zen. They can know their experience of Zen. But you cannot know Zen unless you experience that Zen. And because otherwise they're just ideas of Zen, beliefs of it. And instead, to have trust and confidence and faith in it, it's to have the experiences of it. And Soto Shu just has their way. Rinzai Zen has their way. Tendai Shu has their way. But given the very, very, very overview uh, descriptions of these schools, we can take away the idea that Meditation practice is not just sitting. When you're sitting, you're just sitting. But that's not, just sitting isn't just it. <laughs> More to my point, we can't just sit in meditation and expect us to be Zen. It's not about the time on the cushion per se. We still have to carry on our lives however we choose to do so. So how do we bring the practice off the cushion? Just as Dogen was describing by the end of his life that all actions, experiences, moments can be totally zen. But are we focused enough? Are we diligent, dedicated, devoted? Do we develop our awareness? to become insightful, 
to be able to reflect. The, the doing of the practice is not only the time spent doing the practice. The time, <laughs> the doing of the practice is, is, is not only the time you spend doing the practice. We work to continually be aware of each moment as they pass by and ask ourselves to how can we be better to, to maybe hopefully simplify our lives, to be a little bit more serene, to have a little bit more peace, to, have, to live with a little bit more compassion, loving kindness, joy, equanimity. And, and on the other hand, I get it. Most of us would not escape to a secluded area, um, be sequestered with a gr close group of people, and meditate for 10 plus hours a day. I get that. <laughs> not for everyone. But, what, but the time that we do spend on the cushion, there is a reason for it. There is a purpose. So that we can hopefully clear our minds, deepen our connection to our lack of self, to each other, to the earth, to the cosmos, and so that we can be more aware of every moment off the cushion. And that awareness to bring our life into more equanimity, to be better to make ourselves and our surroundings better. We cannot squander our lives. Thank you so much. Um, and before I open it up to questions and comments, Ichishima Sensei, um, Monshin Sensei, I would ask if you have any comments about Soto Zen, Soto Shu. Ichishima Sensei, what comment do you have? Oh, thank you. Uh... Yes, uh, Dogen is a sincere Buddhist who devoted to this just sitting. And uh, maybe he goes back to Shakyamuni Buddha when he enlightened under the Bodhi tree. Just sitting uh, really is uh, for awareness. And the uh, form of the uh, sitting meditation, especially palm, uh, this is uh, different from Indian style of sitting or no Hyundai way of sitting. Uh, in the case of Soto Zen, uh, <clears throat> left palm on uh, the right, right palm. Uh, while in India and uh, uh, Tendai, right palm on the left palm. So that is a big difference. Uh, I think uh, that both are correct. And uh, in the case of Dogen's, he really interested in, uh, I think, Chinese style of sitting meditation. Chinese style of sitting meditation always left palm on the right palm, which means uh, right is more active uh, and the left is more, uh, uh, what shall I say? Uh, uh, stopping. Static. Yeah, yeah. Static. So uh, in order to stop the movement of mind, uh, left palm placed on the right palm. This is a Dogen style. While it's in India, uh, <clears throat> the style is right palm uh, indicate wisdom. Left palm is indicate uh, meditation. So uh, that, that is a little bit different. But in, anyway, I think uh, Dogen's way of sitting is really correct. Just sit meditation. Let's sit and sit, sit. So this is, uh, he really uh, placed his emphasis on, uh, on the, such a sitting meditation. That mm. is just my comment. Thank you. Mm. Thank you, Thank so you much. Sensei. So um, if I could make a, a really quick comment, and that is uh, when we're talking about uh, Shikantaza, to put it into perspective from Dogen's perspective, it is that he was eschewing the idea of sitting to attain awakening. That's very different from what we see in other schools where one sits to attain awakening. 
In his case, there was no awakening to be attained. And therefore, sitting was being in nirvana. One is in the state of nirvana, if you can call nirvana a state. One is in a state of nirvana when one is sitting. When one gets off the cushion, you want to take that with you, although it's going to decrease the longer you're off the cushion. So therefore, shikantaza, just sitting, means that that's all it is. It's just sitting, but just sitting is being in the state of awakening, which you're not trying to achieve. Because it doesn't have to be achieved. It's you're doing it while you're sitting on the cushion, <laughs> if that makes if that makes sense. So it's it's interesting, and that that's where the, the idea, Dogen's the phrase, uh, Buddhism is the path with no goal. That's where that phrase came from, was from from that idea. You don't have a goal toward awakening. You have a goal toward a, achieving nirvana in this moment while sitting meditation. You know, it's so. You know, there's there's much more that one that one can talk about it, obviously, but. I just want to expand on that on that uh, single issue because I think that really gets to the core of, of Sotoshu and the reason that it's Shikantaza or just sitting. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm going to stop the recording.